So welcome everyone who's here, who's joined us through Facebook Live. Welcome to FIAPO's Learn From Leader webinar series. Uh, we have a very interesting topic today. It's so generally you hear empowered women, empower women, but we are talking about empowered women, empowering animals. So we have two very amazing, very charismatic, empowered women here. There's Thank Sushmita you. and Namita. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about both of them. And before that, I just want to tell you that, you know, so Sushmita is going to do a little bit of a meditation session with us. And uh, we will have, we'll take all your questions. So during the session, if you have anything, you have a comment, you want to interact with both of them, please use the chat option. If you have questions, there is a Q&A option here. You would write it. If you want to be anonymous and you don't want to say your name, please feel free to do so. But do interact. And uh, so inviting my speakers here to very amazing ladies that I'm really, really looking forward to talk to today. Um, a little bit about Sushmita. Uh, so Chef Sushmita is, um, she is, she is known as Sushmita Veganosaurus. She's a vegan chef, podcaster, meditation guide, artist, vegan transition expert, holistic big business coach, and multi-passionate entrepreneur. So you land on her website and you'll feel like you can, you can really take the world by a storm. You can do it all. <laughs> yeah. And she hosts these Feel Good Factor podcast and they they make it, uh, you know, make you understand how happiness has to be the priority in life, which is very wonderful. And uh, she is also the co-founder of Carrots, India's first vegan restaurant, bakery, and a culinary academy. So thank you for being here with us, Sushmita. Thank you for taking this time out and joining us. Thanks. We have, uh, <laughs> thank you. We have Chef Nemita here. Nemita is the founder and vegan chef at An Ode to Gaia. So she's a woman with a mission. And her mission is to challenge these conventional ideas of sustainability in the food industry. And, uh, you know, so if you go through her website and you become a client of hers, you'll really question, you know, your reality and your views about what plant-based food is, right? So she'll give you a wonderful experience of that. And Thank so, um, and Ode to Gaia is a transforming, is, is really transforming people's views about plant-based eating. So um, I welcome you here, and we are very happy to have both of you on this panel. And Sushmita, so we'll start with your meditation session, and we'd love to do it this way. So what do we have to do? Please take us. <laughs> sure. Just going to take a couple of minutes. So hi, everyone, by the way. And thanks so much for the lovely introduction, Sarita. Uh, so all of you, just uh, close your eyes and then just relax. Just be very comfortable. Take a deep breath in and slowly release. One more time. Breathe in deeply. And let it all out. Completely. And one last time. As you breathe in, breathe in a sense of peace, love, calmness. And as you breathe out, let go of whatever you've experienced up to this point today, let go of any stress, any thoughts, anything at all. Just let it go. Set the intention that you're attending the session to learn something. So you will be open to all the new ideas that you hear. Approach everything with curiosity, humility, and a very, very open, compassionate heart. Thank yourself for being here today.
and get very excited about everything that you're going to learn all the ways that you're going to be thinking and how you're going to go out into the world and use it and apply it in your life and whenever you're ready take another deep breath release it slowly rub your palms together and place them over your face and your eyes gently rub your eyes and as you move your palms away open your eyes slowly <sighs> all right <laughs> we're okay. all centered and set in <laughs> wow that was that was some experience thank you that's very interesting never done that before found it really mm-hmm. nice Uh, but I, I think I should be back in the mode of a host because I have to be one. I was really calm. Um, so once again, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. And if you've missed this meditation, please go and watch uh, Sushmita's other things and see one of her sessions maybe coming up sometime soon and be part of it. So yeah, so today we have a topic called Empowered Women, Empowering Animals. And I don't want to... open up as to what this topic entails right now because let the you know the curiosity prevail but we'll straight away go to their stories so these two wonderful women are here with us and they have a big story behind their journey and uh, so maybe we can start with that so sushmita or you can go ahead with you first and then nemita will come to you so sure <laughs> uh, so hi everyone my name is uh, sushmita I've been vegan since 2003 so when I turned vegan it was unheard of back then and because of that I it it helped me in a way because I didn't have many options to just like today how we do I didn't have options to go and just buy stuff and you know just treat myself to all kinds of delicious vegan goodies like like what uh, Nemita makes Uh, so I had to learn to make everything myself from scratch because I'm not the kind of person who believes in just giving up or or you know letting go. And uh, it it opened up my world, and I realized that the variety of things that I could consume, I could eat, I could cook, I could bake was so much more as a vegan than my pre-vegan days, and that uh, set me off on this journey. So the reason I turned vegan was for ethical reasons. I found out about what happens in the animal industry especially in the dairy industry because i was a heavy consumer of dairy and uh, you know after i found out what happened initially i didn't want to know uh, but when i did open myself out to become aware i'm like okay there's no way my taste buds are more important than this and i just turned vegan but though i turned vegan for ethical reasons i had a lot of health benefits out of it i had an increased amount of energy uh, it helped me meditate better and you know connect into this this the uh, the sense my spiritual path so much so much easier so much better uh, you know it grounded me and energized me and all that and of course because i was making all these uh, delicious uh, dishes and experimenting it i was so enthusiastic about it i started a blog my blog called veganosaurus and uh, i would post all my experiments all my recipes uh, out there and uh, from 2006 to 2014 i've shared lots of recipes on my blog and then in at the end of 2013 i joined carrots as a, a co-founder and it changed my life it was always my dream to run my own uh, vegan restaurant cafe but i never got around to doing it i would work with <laughs> other restaurants and cafes and help them introduce vegan food onto their menu i was doing that very regularly but i never got around to starting my own business because i didn't want to deal with the you know setting up a business and the red tape and all these uh, you know the bureaucracy and stuff like that but for me i got lucky because there it was a completely set up business just handed to me on a platter and it just changed my life it was it was an it was an amazing journey for 7 years 
restaurant was around for a year before i joined and then this whole seven years and um, so it was lovely i learned a lot of things i was able to meet a lot of other people i was able to collaborate with so many other conscious business uh, people especially women and i'm i'm still very very passionate about working with women entrepreneurs and encouraging them more and more because i believe that we all need to uh, stick together lift each other up especially when we are in the same mindset you know we are in this community and i feel like even if there are 10 businesses which are exactly alike being run by other vegan women uh, we still are a community and we're not competition because you need more we need more vegan products more vegan everything to be out in the world than there are people to consume it so we need to work together and i'm very passionate about that now carrots closed in jan we couldn't survive the pandemic and it was a very very difficult decision to take but in a way it 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 opened up my time i was more free and so i started my business coaching i started doing more things you know more doing classes online courses things that anyway i was doing before but i could do more of that now so uh yeah so like like sarita was saying i have multiple passions and it's been a great journey and uh, i'm really looking forward to uh, discussing today on this this topic which is very close to my heart and god thank you for sharing this i think um speaks for itself and i think those who do not know please go and check her website she says it's a blog but it's it's a lot more than a blog so there's oh no no a blog is just a part of the website yeah <laughs> the website is veganosaurus.com and the blog is blog.veganosaurus.com <laughs> yes yes please go and check this out so we have nemita nemita your journey is also really wonderful so i've read about it but i'd like you to talk about it elaborately from how you started in a very different place very different <laughs> yeah yeah of course thank you so um i'm i'm nemita i'm a plant based pastry chef and i became a chef uh, kind of by mistake so i'm actually a footwear designer and i was studying in the uk and i was planning to continue living there and i wanted to uh, start a collection in vegan uh, a collection of vegan footwear sustainable ethically made ethically sourced um a men's collection first because i feel like women have so many amazing shoes and really don't <laughs> so but then i i realized that you know india needs uh needs it more india needs people in sustainability and veganism as entrepreneurs a lot more than the uk or anywhere in europe where the market is quite saturated and people already have that awareness so when i moved to i moved back to mumbai and this was in i think 2017 and uh, i was a vegan i had just become vegan a year before that and yeah there were no options for pretty much uh, anything in bombay there were really expensive uh, there was bio life i think uh, or i used to bring that from the uk to be honest and uh, i was making my own almond milk um, <coughs> i was making my own cheesecakes my own desserts i love desserts obviously i'm a pastry chef so yeah i i had to make everything on my own and i actually didn't have any vegan friends i thought i was the only vegan in india like I, i didn't know how big it was until i actually started looking into it i found carrots i found a lot of other places but not too much in mumbai at the time and there was rare earth i believe yeah so i started going to all these potlucks and i would take my uh, oreo cheesecake and raw raw vegan strawberry cheesecake and that's when people were like you know can i order can i order and i had no idea what i was doing i didn't even have like a proper recipe written down but i realized that people were kind of starved for really good you know good quality good tasting vegan desserts because the i think bliss balls were the only thing that people were you know knew how to make or like stuff they something really easy um and and i started researching into uh, vegan desserts into vegan food what i can eat because i did feel like i was restricting my diet a lot um but then the more i looked into it just like uh, sushmita said there's it opened up an entire world of cuisine that i couldn't even imagine was possible like the things you can do with dates the things you can do with cocoa butter being not, not being vegan kind of closed those doors for me and once i started exploring it it was just one after the other i was discovering and creating like incredibly amazing desserts that some of the things don't even exist in the world you know 
so yeah that's how i kind of got into it and then i wanted to just take it to the next level each time and that's how my bakery started yeah and not just in food but i was also i was a, i mean i am a passionate a vegan and intersectional feminist and as i was looking reading more about feminism and food politics that's when i came across veganism and how as i felt it was so essential to me for me to be vegan because it was part of my feminism you know i include non human animals in my feminism that's what makes it intersectional so yeah that's why i'm actually so excited to be here for this topic really wonderful i think uh, you know that thing that you said about how being a non vegan had closed all those doors and turning vegan just yeah. opened up such a horizon for you um you know so like you said that how feminism has <laughs> included a lot of non human animals into it so you know i have spoken to a lot of people over the last few weeks and i've asked them uh, do you understand the link between women empowerment and animal protection or veganism and there is literally no idea like people are like oh this is like one of those dancers doesn't make sense you're talking about women empowerment feminism and you're talking about animals what is the link so can you help us understand and establish what is this connection why are these these two isms uh, so interlinked and inter feminism involves all forms of oppression intersectional feminism involves all forms of oppression and all systems of inequality are a product of the patriarchy all of them you know climate issues uh, feminist issues um, uh, racist issues all of that food inequality all of that is a product of the patriarchy it is because of the patriarchy so feminism and veganism are interlinked because the patriarchy looks at women and animals as products to consume as things for their consumption so when you kind of denounce um the patriarchy you i mean i don't know how to explain like both of them are so interlinked you know so uh, so smita i think we were talking about this yesterday and i completely forgot my point <laughs> so see the 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 female body is ex, you know it's it's exploited a lot in the exactly. animal industry too it's not you know it's just the way the human female body is exploited and when you say exploited it's not just exploited in terms of just abuse uh, that is one thing but we are talking about the you know the the micro ways it's done the nuanced yeah. ways it's done so for example uh, for women it's believed like yeah what you know you you the, your 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 ultimate goal in life is to give birth bear children be a mother you know that is that is what a woman exactly. is viewed as in the traditional patriarchal sense right and then same thing when it comes to the animal's body the the cow is what i mean it's just like the milk of the cow they say oh mother cow she gives it's us the milk. baby milk machine right so it's it they they the cow has to be she has to get impregnated repeatedly if she has to produce milk and this is something i don't know if everybody even thinks of this and i had not thought of this before i turned vegan i it never occurred yeah. to me but all mammals need to give birth if they have to produce milk so the cow is repeatedly impregnated abused it's not like you know um it's it's just like any human or any other animal it's not the most comfortable or most enjoyable feeling going through this whole cycle of pregnancy birth again and again and plus her baby is taken away from her so that milk can be consumed and these things yeah. are considered normal right so this objectification and exploitation of the female body is very strong and nemita you were talking about how even when it comes to meat the parts you know you were you were talking about the chicken body part of yes like we talk about animal products as a juicy breast or a thigh and that's how we use women's bodies for advertisements as well you know we use women's breast to advertise pens or we use like women's legs to advertise <laughs> cars i mean there is no correlation in a naked woman and a car that you want to buy but that again is it's attracting patriarchal men feminist men are not going to look at an advertisement of for a car and look at a naked woman and say yeah let me go and buy that you know so we are this is a product of um, the patriarchy again and the same way that animals are reduced to their body parts women are reduced to their body parts yeah 
So in a way, I think it. Uh, you are you saying that it does not only involve female, female exploitation in animals. It's like overall it's exploitation. Animals. The male chicks are ground up alive. and you know in feminism we include things like men's mental health because that is also a product of the patriarchy so in our feminism and veganism we are also addressing you know the male chicks and all the male calves that are killed hmm. so it it is holistic yeah yeah so uh, you know there's there's this question that comes up so we understand that there is a correlation there is the this the two things are not two separate issues they're very much intertwined so one may choose to work for women uh, upliftment of women in a certain way but at the same time your values and ethics remain the same for animals so how i'm trying to understand how if you empower women can it help animals like do you do it simultaneously do you actually work for animals rights or how if i am a feminist if i work my work involves only working with women um like you know there is a divide when it comes to the the whole sector of human development in animals right so some people are only working in in on human issues on women empowerment how does like, how do we bring the two together then so no issue is uh, greater or lesser than the other everything does need help and the thing is the ultimate uh, the bottom line of this is compassion and inclusion <laughs> right and then if you start working on one issue so the, see i'll tell you the reverse for me so i, I was not necessarily aware of feminism and the feminist ideas before i turned vegan you know i was not open to these things but i once i did turn vegan what happened was i'm questioning all these norms and these these you know cultural norms right that have been set up and when you start questioning these norms you start looking at ha huh, what else is there if if i believe this all my life i believe milk is good for you and it's it's natural to have milk i believe this because i've been told this lie What so else? Then, lies yeah, are... yeah. What else? What are the lies have been told? And then you start questioning. So the the way to do this is it's nothing. You just have to question everything. Don't mm. believe what has just been told to you. Mm. And when you say, okay, this is my right to do something. For example, when it comes to food, you say it's my right to consume meat, right? again draw that parallel if you're w- working in the women sector how many women have been abused because people you know their husbands or somebody else thought it was their right to do so exactly. they feel like you're there and you know i i can do what i want right and that's the same way we treating animals and i know if uh, somebody has been a victim of this it may seem like we're diminishing their suffering by comparing it to an animal suffering because they may not uh, make that connection but i feel like if it's if there is compassion for everybody that is a root cause that is what is going to actually yes. solve the issue right from your plate Mm-hmm. Yes, I completely agree with you. The patriarchy decides what is worthy, what is worthy, and what isn't worthy, right? So when you are kind of denouncing that and you're choosing, you're choosing veganism, you're kind of slapping the patriarchy in its face, and that's a huge thing. That's a lot of a lot of the times people don't realize how important one issue. It's kind of like a domino effect, and intersectional feminism deals with oppression. across everything food gender sexuality race you know everything so when you're looking at food through a feminist lens okay you're kind of understanding the unequal distribution of food and when you look at animal agriculture there are um slaughterhouse workers go through so much like mental health crisis they go through they, there's no kind of therapy for you know slaughterhouse workers they go through a lot of issues and usually food uh, like usually meat it's not really food meat is grown with uh, grown through i mean what do what do animals eat they eat soy they eat processed uh, processed food and the amount of water and food it takes the amount of resources it takes to have to grow uh, or nurture or raise one cow it can feed hundreds of people 
you know what i mean so it's like unequal distribution of food and unequal distribution of resources and that is a feminist issue there are millions hundreds and thousands of people who are starving and that food is going to animals just so one person can consume a cow versus hundreds of people can who can eat from eat that grain who can use that water there are droughts in countries where animals are still being given food and water while people are starving and the people who starve the most are women and children okay yeah so shweta you have something to say ah uh, yeah no so namita was uh, she brought up a very good point about the mental health of the slaughterhouse workers right and they end up uh, committing suicide a lot of times um, that is one thing another is that also they get violent now most of the slaughterhouse workers you would say are men and it breeds violence so who do they go yeah. home and take it out on who are the weaker people they are taking it out on right so this is and it's not that they are born bad people it's the situation where they they are already underprivileged nobody who is rich and who is privileged will say oh, i'll work, work in a slaughterhouse yeah. yeah. right it's it's a it's a very difficult job to do and you have to you really have to uh, separate yourself right because you you shouldn't oh i'm killing uh of uh, uh, if you're doing that yeah so you have to like really block that part off you have to kill off the certain part of yourself and say that no you know i can't have compassion because then that's going to you know it's it's going to be horrible for you to even have be compassionate and do this right mm-hmm. and then once it's switched off what do you do you go out into the world and so a lot of um, you know nemita you were talking about this uh, you know yesterday when we were we were on the call you were saying that a lot of the human um, violence against humans also come from people starts, who are violent against yes, animals starts with animals actually a lot of serial killers start by killing animals uh, when they are young and then they grow up and kill humans so when you are a slaughterhouse worker you a lot of the times they don't want to be there uh in the us they use illegal immigrants i'm sure in india they are using marginalized people it there is a lot of caste based violence which again is a feminist issue and yeah they don't want to be violent but when they have to shut off that switch and be violent towards the animals you can't then turn on that switch later you know you then you just continue to normalize that violence in other aspects of your life you're kind of losing your hum- humanity each time you're doing that and i think a lot of people don't really see animals as individual beings the same way the patriarchy looks at women as products of con- as as things to consume as products you know they talk about women like items you know like Property. they call us items yeah they yeah, call like talk items <laughs> animals the same way like like they trade cows and goats for brides they do that even now so women and animals are placed on the same plane as products or currency which we neither of us are yeah and then when women as women try to get out of that we can't do it just for ourselves we need to bring everybody else yeah. up with us right yeah. like yeah. how all yeah. women need to support each other and pull each other up you can't say only certain like that's where the intersectional feminism also comes in right you can't say only people of this <coughs> privilege this race are the women that need help first then we will hmm. look at the other women it, it cannot be that right so you have to bring everybody up together with you and which is where you can be inclusive of the animals breaking up i can't hear you oh nevita it must be your connection um, we can see you frozen a bit here on the screen yeah um but can we go ahead with what you were saying sushmita i think you were making up no so that that that's pretty much it like you know yes, everybody needs to be lifted up together because that's the only way to do it you know that's the only way though the struggle is harder when you are more inclusive it's not easy but also think that the more inclusive you are the more people you have in your ranks to help the cause help yes, the movement hmm so what what you know what kind of like it sounds and it concludes into that you know if you let violence prevail in any manner or if you let let this objectification go on in any manner with any species any race any any particular species or a person the practice will still prevail so like it it catches up fast yes. on someone else too so um, the root cause has to be dealt with you know the like you brought up that how uh, you know most of these crimes so yeah, uh, yesterday i was talking to somebody about cannibalism and they were taking uh, you know this, this dialogue took shape and how these people don't start out by just eating up 
human beings. They start with like smaller <coughs> crimes, like you know, uh, letting out their anger on yes. animals. So you know that the effect, if not <coughs> dealt with at an early level, that's what happens. Humans losing their humanity by every minute. Right. So definitely understand the that. The change has started at a systemic level. As, sorry, you were um, a bit frozen. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just said that the change has to happen on a systemic level, not on a. It, it has to, of course, happen on, in a holistic way. Laws have to be made, and the lawmakers have to abide by that. We cannot have lawmakers, firstly, who are rapists and you know chauvinists. and we cannot have teachers who don't understand the nuances of feminism as well it starts from a real young age it starts in your home it starts in your school and the food you eat also you i mean you're taught you're not taught about veganism or animal advocacy or uh, climate change or you're not taught about any of that like i was so passionate about environmental studies and people used to take environmental studies because they thought it's easier than uh, physics or uh, chemistry or something i mean it was a bit easier but i was so passionate about it and my my uh, environment teacher he never taught us about um the the anim- the meat industry or he never even ever spoke about veganism and now looking back i'm like you were such an environmentalist why were you eating meat it just it just didn't click so it ha- change has to ha- happen on a fundamental educational and systemic level and and governmental level hmm so i hear what you're saying i have a question here though so uh, let's talk a little about you know when you said that you know when you were a kid you were studying about uh, environmental studies you were going um, and nobody was teaching you about me but they are so naive and in indian context children don't even have that power to choose what they want to eat at home they 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 can certainly have a dialogue but the parents do define a lot about what they're going to consume how they're going to consume uh, so how like you know what what kind of uh, you know talk around these issues can be done with children do you think is it is it uh, is it okay to tell them about these abuses and this this kind of uh, you know cruelty at that very young age where where you know they may learn they may question but they may not have the authority to change something easily so they, it brings in helplessness is is what i'm trying to understand and what do you do about it so sushmita maybe you can also answer this sure um see it's what else do you expose your children to today right so we want to be conscientious and we like oh we can't tell them about the violence against animals yeah it doesn't have to be shown in a very violent or gory way right there are so many beautiful children's books which explain yeah. the reality without actually brushing it off as a happy go lucky thing but also without showing the gore and uh, something uh, traumatic to the kids but w- the kids are exposed to so much crap so much violence already you know yeah. whether it's on tv whether for it is right there's so much given uh, even as a very very young child you are given gi joe toys or whatever you know like okay i'm gi joe i'm not aging myself by saying gi joe but <laughs> like uh, you are given these violent things to play with and you know bashing each other up whatever it is right there's a lot of that that happens so in fact kids are systematically being taught it may not be direct way but very indirectly being taught that it's okay to harm others it's okay to be violent so why not teach kids you know approach this from a kindness perspective where it is important to be kind to others people around you it's important to be kind to um, you know even people who may seem rough or seem you know uh, so called bad there is a reason why they may be he- behaving in such a way yeah. so this thing of uh, being understanding being <laughs> compassionate towards others and which again extend that out to being compassionate towards animals so this this kind of education is it's it's similar to where we say feminism and it's only women who are be, you know if if only girls are being taught you protect yourself you do this you do this it's not going to make a difference this. 
yeah if you if young men are taught that see you know they are not your property simple as that don't be a jerk you know it's simple as that it's it's not about a girl has to be a certain way or then you have to respect her no it's not even that she can be whatever the hell she wants but she is not your property similarly you know you need to extend that out to the children and and teach them that nobody is your property how to be kinder how to be more compassionate it can be done in a very very positive uh, way and uh, you were talking about the indian context and honestly again we do have these um, uh, what do you say these these uh, things about ahimsa about kindness these are there in the cultural indian thing also you use that and connect that see a lot of dissonance is there yeah ahimsa but only this person deserves it this person doesn't deserve it that dissonance we need to break away <laughs> so i hear you there are there are different ways in which it can be communicated and the choice they will make on their own is it's important to talk about it that's very true dialogue uh, that's it yeah someone here also agrees and they something very um, you know i think it also reminds me of this book called the little prince it says that adults think they already know too much to change yeah that's absolutely true thank you sara um um so this kind of brings in into uh, the conversation here is something very important then what are some other ways to change like what are some other forms of changes this was about children i wanted to add to uh, sushmita's point sorry i i my screen froze for a minute so i couldn't uh, see anything so you know how children are taught i mean so, somehow somewhere they are taught to be bullies or they are taught to be racist or they are taught to be violent towards women from a really young age like they you know pinch a girl or run behind her and girls are taught that, oh he likes you that kind of conditions women to say that yeah it's or conditions young girls to associate violence and you know Uh, as something as a guy likes you so it's okay that he hits you so somebody somewhere is teaching these boys to do that so if they can teach them to be violent racist homophobic sexist then why can't they teach them compassion instead you know if they can teach you to do the bad things why can't you be taught to do the good things so i think yeah that boils down to you know in in the indian context especially parents thinking that children are not children are actually so much smarter than adults because they are raw unfiltered they are born compassionate and then they are taught to not be compassionate they are they, you know i have so many young girls who message me on my personal instagram page or uh, on facebook or on my otu gaya page asking me you know how to be vegan and they are so young like 12 14 16 and they don't have an income uh, since they are still in school and you know they can't save because they have no money coming in and in india you know kids don't really work like the way they do abroad so they don't really know how to you know consume vegan products and when they talk to the i've always recommended that they you know share some easy non gruesome documentaries with their parents or i can speak to their parents or just educating their parents on veganism um and the parents just don't want to hear it because you know milk is good for your bones and meat is good if you don't eat meat you're not going to grow up and be a big strong boy so a lot of the times the parents are so rigid because they want to and have to believe that they know more than the children that they know more than the kids that smarter than kids and when kids have an opinion it's like shut up don't back answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it it's also about you know the our parents also not, never had the kind of exposure that we are having today we talk about these issues um, i don't think you know for my parents like nobody ever spoke to them about this they didn't know they they just took it by you know just the way it was given to them they were like okay this is yes. said to us we do it and i think it it's difficult to break these layers when you're an adult versus when you're a child you you still like you said you're unfiltered you don't have as many layers you're still learning and i'm totally understand totally agree to that so um um the, the second part of question that i was uh, asking is what are the some other ways of changing so like someone here has said something about <coughs> does um, you know this person has asked the question does empowered women only uh, qualifies um, you know only people who are independent in terms of financial and societal norms are empowered are they the empowered what about the homemakers what about women who don't have an income what about women who don't have uh, you know the kind of exposure uh, maybe i have maybe you have maybe someone else has what if they don't have those platforms to talk about what if they don't have that kind of community to hear them how can they make some contribution into into 
know bring to feminism veganism how could what can be their contribution firstly feminism is not an elitist concept feminism starts there are different forms of feminism for urban women like us feminism involves equal pay equal opportunity it involves you know being able to being able to say no to things wearing what we want but when you look at you know people uh, marginalized people adivasi women people who live in villages who obviously are not don't have corporate jobs feminism for them involves equal opportunities equal like working so you know a lot of women work on farms but they are not considered farmers they don't get paid their husbands get paid for their work but the their women and children are also working on the farms but the women don't get paid there was um an article i read about women uh working in i think sugarcane or wheat or something in in um, maharashtra in some small farm in maharashtra and the women were women who couldn't have children because they they were surgically made to remove their wombs and that was by their employer just because they didn't want them to take menstrual like like they didn't want them to have a menstrual leave or have a pregnancy leave like maternity leave so they were surgically made to take like they were made to take off take out their wombs that is so messed up on on such a you know fundamental level so that is so feminism doesn't just mean you know we get uh, paid equally or we can wear like short skirts or whatever it means it, feminism in intersectional feminism involves marginalized women dalit women it involves men as well you know not just elitist upper caste upper class urban women yeah and uh, another thing i'd like to add is that if you go back to the more uh, the, the tribes but the more peaceful tribes who live living really good lives you know if you go more into their cultures you will see that there is an equality uh, among men and women the women are empowered therefore these societies are thriving the way that thriving, they are yes. you know matriarchal societies those particularly you do see that okay you, you give a woman this place of okay you know these are your strengths you are able to see certain things a certain way say things a certain way uh, and give this kind of advice and you give that power uh, there's a lot of beautiful stuff that comes out of it and you know like nemita said it's not just women it's feminism involves men too obviously yeah. right it's it's about the again be it's ultimately anybody being able to be being able to do whatever they want to do however they want to do it as long as it's not harming others yeah. that's it that that is feminism yeah. you know it's it's like everybody should be free to be who they are do what they want to do whether you're a man woman whether you're privileged yeah. whether you're under privilege that's the way um it is a lot is. of people don't realize that feminism isn't just for women it's for anybody who has been you know touched by the patriarchy and that's everybody yeah and uh, you know talking about being touched by the patriarchy if you go back to a few centuries before the british occupation of india uh, there was again a lot more equality and a lot more uh, you know but they there were more matriarchal societies and even if they weren't matriarchal societies the kind of uh, power the kind of freedom that women held was entirely different patriarchy came from that victorian mentality you know it was imposed on uh, indian by the brits to a large extent um so there's there's this uh, uh, book that i'm reading called the ivory throne uh, and uh, by manu pillai and he goes back into this he goes digs deep into the olden cultures uh, ancient cultures and you know all those uh, um, you know all the all the systems that were in place and how things were going well and how the british came and took that all away because they had their uh, lens of okay women only have to do this do that be that they cannot be you know more powerful than men they cannot have that freedom they are the properties of the husbands this is not even an indian thing this comes from the british thing and even the caste system as it is now which also you know is is a lot to do with oppression wasn't this way pre british 
the again a lot of it was influenced by the british used that to divide they're like okay so you know they started it, 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 they started putting out this thing first of all they brainwash people into thinking that uh, following things and doing things the british way is a greater way of doing right things way, and the yeah. rest is backwards right and then they started saying oh you know the the higher caste people do what the british are doing so that's what makes them higher caste or makes them better um, yes so then that divides the others right that makes the others so called lower caste so there is that also so if we actually start going back into the roots of our culture and take things from there then the question the person has asked about how do you help people or how do you you know uh, bring feminism across the board it's by just going back and referring to that and try to bring back you know like you you just have to um, ditch colonial ideas <laughs> that have been planted in our heads yeah, i agree i agree to a certain extent but i also think the caste system was there much before the british and uh, yeah and i think the caste system as a whole needs to be abolished versus you know taking bits Absolutely. and pieces of it that actually made sense because i mean none of it made sense no no and, that's true yeah. that and i absolutely even, agree yeah and even before the british came we did have levels of inequality where women were made to wear the parda or women were not did not have equal opportunity in terms of work or pay and women were considered you know breeders so that was there before the british came as well they obviously made the situation much It much worse, worse than that because they yeah. used it they leveraged yeah. the quality and and you know the that level of uh, patriarchal oppression was there much before the british came and i think that is a product of religion as well yeah so i i think we kind of going into Let's a different section altogether yeah but coming back to the question that we were talking about animal protection and veganism so um you know we've had this beautiful discussion we've established so much about that you know how the two are not two different things how you you carry out the practice of one and you are supporting the animals if you are working for women empowerment you your beliefs and your you know the questions that you will ask yourself and others will also make them question their beliefs on every level towards every speech so uh, you know then um, let's bring it down on a very simpler level okay so um, you know that you know sometimes what happens is that you know when we are aware we we, we are no theoretically conceptually we are practicing it but what about that one person who's just fairly newly learning and is like is all taken by this whole oh, it's so overwhelming for people who have ju- who have just yeah. started to explore this it's like a rabbit hole and you know they cannot uh, they cannot differentiate then what's right what's wrong there's such a large information dump on the internet yes yes exactly so what what, what would you say to such a person like where do we start from what can we do and uh, you know i truly understand that compassion is the way but i want to also bring in the element i just want to say this to our audience that for you also have the compassion for yourself maybe you did not have the opportunity to question this before or like you know if you're having a moment um even you didn't have this before so be compassionate with yourself but what what do we do like how do we break it down to the smallest level the basic most level what do we do now now that we've understand that both things are uh, one what kind of differences can i make you if- start slowly incorporating vegan options it doesn't have to be i know a lot of vegan activists say you have to do everything in one go but that is not going to happen realistically people are not going to just become vegan overnight although i know a lot of people who've done it successfully i think the first step would be reeducation unlearning what you've learned all your life and relearning what you want to learn and looking at all sides of it and then making a decision so obviously there's no two sides of the dairy industry dairy is brutal it is disgusting it is rape it is what no matter what you say it is you know a sexual abuse sexual assault of the female animal so there's no like two sides of that so the first thing someone can do is just simply replace their dairy based milk with uh, you know any other any there's affordable brands there's, there's expensive brands there's brands that are in between so they can replace dairy they can make yogurt there are small changes you can start you know i used to make uh, dishes and feed my parents and my friends and i wouldn't even tell them it's vegan and then they would like my friends would come to my house and they would be like nemita i can't believe you've made uh, mutton or biryani or something and after they would eat the entire meal i would be like oh psych it's vegan <laughs> so you know you can start small introduce one food group at a time 
and then it's going the transition is going to be easier hmm. but you've got to start somewhere and i think dairy you know omitting dairy is the easiest and first step especially in indian households you even get vegan ghee now so honestly there's no excuse to you know not do it that's true. and um, i like to add to that that also you don't have to go out and buy it you can easily yeah. make your own dairy alternatives exactly. at home like like so this. <laughs> yeah hardly takes a couple of minutes and um whenever i teach uh, my i i am very passionate about empowering people to make their own food for this reason i'm like yeah you spoil yourself you order from outside you and especially because you want to support all the vegan businesses do it but before everything else empower yourself to know how to make all these alternatives for yourself and also like nemita said to trick others or uh, give others so yeah. in in my <laughs> i i call it vegan temptivism i coined this term for it where you're tempting people you know activism in, through yeah. food <laughs> basically um so learn to make this and in all the dairy alternative classes when i teach people hey you know this is how you make almond milk and they make it and they're like oh my god this is ridiculously is simple so i never easy. imagined it you know so learn to make it and yes um you know like sarita said be compassionate to yourself so it's not about like oh no i did my biggest regret is i didn't do this before or oh no what have i been contributing to don't go into that go be more joyful about it be more curious about it uh, see how you can make your whole journey just easier for yourself and more happier for yourself you know when uh, i know a lot of people who who are amazing activists but what they do is they subject themselves to watching all these you know the violence the videos and then they yeah. go out and do i always say protect yourself from that you already know what's happening don't keep looking because you you are the center of your universe whatever you focus on that's what you're attracting into your life so you want to attract more positivity and when you uh, are a happy vegan and you truly love this life who would people would want to be you so lead by example right the, so they just want to be like you they're like oh my god look at this person so happy so full of energy so full of joy then i want this too so how do i do this I'm like okay go vegan and this is how you do it um and uh, doing it slowly step by step and one thing i'm in complete alignment with nemita is about quitting dairy first if you have to do it step by step quit yeah. dairy first and not meat because dairy is worse than meat too for the animal yeah. for for your health oh, overall it's just a worse thing but i also have seen this thing work where pe- see people are afraid of commitment and if you think this is a lifelong thing that you're going to do uh, you may not be want to do it but tell yourself okay i'm going to strictly do this for 30 days for one month i'll, I'll just do this very strictly follow it what happens is when people do this and they expose themselves and I, and i say that when you do it don't just give up stuff alternatives you know introduce all the other stuff and all the goodies and expose yourself to this and when they do this i see that two things happen one is the addiction goes away because dairy yeah. has casomorphins which are addictive so as with any addictive substance it cannot just gradually it's not so easy to gradually let it go because then the chance of slipping is more but if you completely cut it off the, you get over that addiction in <coughs> fact um i used to love drinking milk plain cow's milk you know without sugar nothing big glasses of it exactly you can't even think that with a straight face even exactly <laughs> like you know it's like what you know puke tastic now when i think about it but after i went vegan a few months down the line i realized that you know if i went to somebody's house and they're boiling milk in the kitchen which is in the other room i can smell it and it's like gag reflex it's me gag yeah. right and i'm like what this is a person who is to love dairy like crazy so then your addiction goes away if you do this like you know just cut it off completely if you are able to so there are both the methods to to try there are many ways to do it there is no yeah. right or wrong way that's ultimately mine and i see that the second thing that happens is and because the addiction is gone and because they have opened themselves up to this amazing world they don't want to go back to the other world very often people just stick to it and that's the way it is so try it in any way just make the journey very joyful for yourself you know that is very very important <laughs> and another thing i realized that happened with me like i used to eat a lot of eggs i mean i used to eat meat dairy everything 
another thing i realized was i stopped i consciously stopped looking at animal products as food and i started looking at it as exactly what it is an egg is a thing that's coming out of an animal's butt okay i am not going to eat that or like milk it's breast milk of an animal so when i when i look at it as that it just makes me gag like it's not appetizing at all so when you start looking at looking at not looking at as food but looking at it as exactly what it is like a dead bird or a dead i don't know pig or something you kind of condition yourself to not want to eat that that helped me a lot that uh, yeah so what i hear is like you know gradual is the way but yes. like staying true to that streak if you've decided to do it then um, try with alternatives but like um and so but there is this still one question okay so when somebody starts to transition what really happens is you have these miss outs you not so i've seen a lot of people um even in my case when i became a vegan when i started transitioning i ate honey one time and i was like oh god no this happened i didn't realize and then you know the guilt of it it just kills you and you're surrounded by a community of people who are working for this and you're day in day out listening to this and then you know how in the world am i not conscious enough when i'm picking something up and then you no. a lot of people i know that beat themselves down <laughs> how do you get over this how do you get over the sense of judgment that comes with it no you're... single person can be no one's perfect i have made so many mistakes when i started with uh, you know when i started when i first became vegan i was so hard on myself i made a mistake and ate something with dairy like i would look at the vegetarian label and say oh yeah this is vegetarian and then i would not assume that something like that would have dairy or something would have honey or carmine so no one can be perfect when you're starting out you are going to make mistakes and the meat and dairy industry they sneak in things that you can't even imagine like why would you know potato chips have milk in it it's a potato chip like it doesn't need milk so i think don't beat yourself up over you know a uh, small mistakes that you didn't deliberately do like you didn't go out of your way and then kill that fish and be like we let me eat that now you know so mistakes happen and you consciously choose to you know move on and not make that mistake again and that also is a teaching moment like okay i i didn't imagine these potato chips will have milk so now i know what to look for the next time i'm buying chips or just make them yourself <laughs> <laughs> and not just that you know what you were saying you look at the ingredients so look we all need to look at ingredients oh, that, yeah. you know you just have to do it you just have to ask you need to ask questions you need to look at ingredients it doesn't matter what people around you think don't give a damn about it if somebody had allergies them asking questions yeah, about allergies, allergies. right it's, it's accepted people who argue with you in the beginning will accept you later not just accept they'll support you also they will make special vegan stuff for you also don't worry about that right don't bother about what others are thinking or again you know women do this right you make yourself small and be more polite just to you know make others comfortable around you we can do this too you know don't do that right uh what it, what you do however is you read ingredients always and then even by mistake if you consume anything it's that teaching moment like she said you, you will never ever ever forget it and yeah. not just that you will stop others from making that mistake you will tell others about this you'll like guess what even potato chips may have milk so watch out read the ingredients this will have i tell you this is not these are not mistakes that happen only in the beginning 10 years after i turned vegan i i had gone to this restaurant i used to go to this restaurant where they have chapati and chutney and this potato thingy you know which they would serve and i would have that once in a while and i used to enjoy it a lot i take my friend that day to the restaurant and uh, she wanted puri that day so you know while ordering puri i asked the waiter i'm like hey does this have uh, does does that puri do have any dairy in it because really chana patura do has uh, you know curds in it so i thought maybe puri if they add something and he's like oh oh ma'am no 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 we don't put anything like that in uh, you know in puri do but chapati do we put milk i like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> so we we um have this in the vegan bangalore group we call it the vegan reset and we tease ourselves we're like oh you know it's a reset and you have to restart again your whole 10 years over now it's zero days you know uh, but don't beat yourself about it laugh about it you know it's okay and it's not like you've done any big deal by having help right and by something. beating yourself up over it nothing's going to happen you can't undo that moment 
exactly yeah and not is that people use that as an excuse many times to i've seen oh i've anyway eaten of ghee now let me once in a while start having this start having that's a slippery slope if you go into the guilt mode but if you go into the mode of okay it happened it's like you know you're walking and you fell once that doesn't mean you have to keep falling no you're like okay yeah. i fell what to do brush yourself up <laughs> and just keep exactly. going ahead <laughs> yeah so this has been a wonderful discussion and i think we can continue to go on for another 2 hours if we had <laughs> keep at it but i'd like uh, you know the people who are here and on facebook to have an opportunity to ask any question we are already at 6 um i wouldn't say i don't know how this happened because i was looking at the clock but the discussion here was really wonderful and you guys leveraged it because you didn't ask question in between so uh, it's also on you but if you do have question please uh, put them here in the chat box ask anything um this is your moment shweta says all the oh. points are already beautifully explained and covered okay thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> who is looking to transition while sarita was introducing me she did mention that i am a vegan transition guide and the, the that being i like to help people go vegan i do have a lot of content freely on my instagram page where i talk about these things i share some recipes i share you know also these transition stories and things like that on uh, emita's uh, screen has chosen she says uh, but if you would like to seriously take a course and do this and this is for vegans transitioning vegans vegan curious people all of it where i cover everything related to being a joyful vegan not just vegan but how to make your life happier so i go to it through mind body spirit so mind would be how to change your mindset when it comes to dealing with other people especially when it comes to you know living a vegan life body is of course food so i create this foundation of how you can do recipes how you can cook and how you can understand food better how to eat vegan in a more um, you know aware way and finally spirit where i've shared meditations and journaling activities affirmation and things again to help you on your journey it's called the vegan immersion experience i have a link to the course on my website so if anybody you know wants to commit to doing a course like that uh for a it, it's it's a month long course that goes on every day you get a different lesson you know and and do it so do look into that i think in the beginning i was before this whole conversation started i was telling nemita that the ode to an ode to gaia is something to land at you know it's so beautiful and it's so so beautiful like the, the experience that you have on that website it's really really soothing so please go and see that you know vegan uh, vegan things are so wonderful and there is so much variety and if you are around in mumbai or you want to order something you have that facility too so please order in please enjoy relish thank you so much and, uh, yeah please go to vegan sorus for uh, sushmita already said that you are transitioning and you want to you know know something you want to learn with her you want to learn cooking you can also i think there are classes where you do this right you also give uh, classes about how to do vegan cooking yeah i teach uh, you know when at, at when pre pandemic we would have a lot of physical classes at the restaurant and then during the pandemic what we did is we did a lot of online classes and the videos from these classes are also available for people to just uh, you know I, we have a i mean i've, I've set up this uh, you know vegan uh, thing where you have a bunch of recipes and videos and you can register for that and then watch those recordings of those courses ask questions there and things like that but also particularly because i am super passionate about dairy alternatives i have a one to one dairy alternatives course you can book a session with me it's it's a class where i send you in advance what all to prep and keep ready and then do it's a video call where we do you know just you and me and i'll tell you okay grind this do this mix that and you will be making with your hands all these delicious dairy alternatives and then you'll be like whoa you know <laughs> uh, so yeah you can you can everything's on the website you can just find all these details um, and then <laughs> you can join and my instagram has yeah like i said information recipes what not wow and it's amazing i'm so nervous to do online classes but i also stopped teaching all my classes because of the pandemic and now everybody wants it online but i've never done online classes it's so scary it's it's easier than you would imagine amita actually you know so go ahead do it if you're passionate about teaching then you should definitely be hosting the first one at the end of the month 
Awesome. <laughs> Great. So that's wonderful. So I think at the end, we've also come to something you can see live how these two are interacting about. They are empowering each other as well. They're <laughs> encouraging each other to do something. So uh, thank you for being such a patient audience. So wonderful. Uh, I see that, you know, um, we are at 6 or 7. So we'll... We'll close this webinar, but with that, I really want to thank everybody who's here on Facebook Live, both of you guys, you were amazing, amazing. And I think we should have more of these discussions. So I can understand that it may take some time today to sink in and then come back. So it's wonderful. Thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. So we'll- Thank you for having us. Thanks, Sarita. And that was lovely talking with you, Nemita. I love the whole flow of yeah, the conversation. Really <laughs> uh, Apanna, Shwet, everybody who's commented, I'm, I, the, the comments just disappear because I'm on the phone. But thank you for uh, writing in your comments and also being here. And uh, Sarita, lovely that you've organized this. Thank you. And thanks to Fiapo too.